Hello, my name is Lowell Vanderpool and this channel is dedicated to IT students, IT professionals, and anyone who enjoys learning technical subjects. When Microsoft initially announced Windows 11 and that it was going to require TPM 2.0, there was a lot of conversation on social media, from conspiracy theories to you name it. In truth, it's a very important move by Microsoft to better secure the Windows platform. You don't have to be too smart in this world to understand that Windows is a huge target of criminals and nation states and can be compromised. So Microsoft moving to TPM 2.0 just absolutely makes sense. So let's go in and take a look at TPM 2.0 and understand it and see what it brings to the table in terms of security. Gene Spafford is a Purdue professor in computer science and a well-respected security specialist. He made this comment about today's PC security, and this is what he said. He said, using encryption on the internet is the equivalent of arranging an armored car to deliver credit card information from someone living in a cardboard box to someone living on a park bench. That's a clear picture of today's PC security and why Microsoft has to move to a more secure environment for Windows operating system. Windows is that cardboard box or park bench as Gene Spafford so so excellently commented on today's security. Microsoft has actually been asking hardware vendors to include TPM in all enterprise hardware since 2016 but now is going to require Windows 11 for everyone at least TPM 2.0. A lot of blowback, a lot of people are looking at ways to get around it, but it really doesn't benefit anybody in the ecosystem of today's internet to not get on board with this technology. So what do you get with TPM and Windows 11? TPM allows what is known as a root of trust. It validates your boot files are legitimate, that the OS is the original image from Microsoft, and that the OS image after running 10 hours is still un tampered. Now this includes more than just what Microsoft is going to provide for the user, typical home user, but it is definitely where enterprises are going. Now let's be honest, TPM is not a silver bullet for security, but allows the beginning of a layered approach and a much more difficult environment to tamper with and compromise. Windows 10 and Windows 11 provide layers of security. If you'll look at my security settings in my Windows 11 box, you'll see core. I isolation, leveraging virtualization to isolate critical computer processes from any malicious code in your operating system. We also have security processor, which is my TPM, and I've enabled secure boot. These are fundamental basic concepts of security. If everyone on the internet would begin to apply these capable components of security, it would change a lot of the problems that we have today. All right, let's get started with TPM, Trusted Platform Module. The key to TPM is that it has to be very secure and very inexpensive to implement in products. That is a very important concept for us to begin this discussion with. Now there are other methods to secure identity and other types of layered approaches. One is smart cards, which is, was very popular for a while. TPMs are half the cost of a smart card. There's also the use of an RSA token. Uh, you can see one here in the graphics. I've got an RSA token and that also can provide a 
identity and security in many ways, adding those layers of security. But TPM is almost a third of the cost of a RSA token type environment. So what is a TPM? A TPM is a system that is actually added to a motherboard. This system has a state and is separate from the motherboard and operating system to which it reports. The only interaction between the system inside TPM and the host system is through the interface specified and defined by TPM 2.0. TPMs have processors, RAM, ROM, and flat. TPMs can bring a lot to the table. One, they provide anti-tampering against physical attacks. They provide cybersecurity against remote attacks. They provide a secure way of key management, secure boot, and cryptology or data at rest. They provide reliability against hardware and software failure. TPMs provide trust. What is trust? An entity can be trusted if it always behaves in the expected manner for the intended purpose. That's the definition of trust. All computer controlled hardware needs a root of trust. Let's take for example Andy Greenberg who writes for Wired took a bunch of hackers with him on inside of his Jeep Cherokee in 2015. They were able to hack his Jeep Cherokee and switch off his brakes remotely. Not cool. The same year Tesla Model S was produced and they had many many layers of security and hackers again tried to publicly hack the Tesla and they were only able to sound the horn. I'd rather them sound the horn than turn off my brakes. Toyota, Honda, and Kia, even as, as late as 2020, were able with this RFID cloning kit that you see here in the, the graphic, were able to allow them to clone the RFID keys and steal the vehicle without a trace. None of these hacks are easy to do and it takes professionals and people that know what they're doing, but it makes us aware of the importance of securing all computer controlled hardware from cars to our PCs. This is Intel's version of the next generation of automobiles where we're gonna be using TPMs for root of trust, a secure boot process and the use of hypervisors to isolate protected and unprotected operating spaces. Now this is a block diagram what you just saw in the graphic. How will your next generation car start? It will start with a cryptographic hash or a digital signature with signing and verification. So cars will start with a root of trust before they will actually apply gasoline or electricity and begin moving that car. Another way to look at TPM is a secure crypto processor. So who created TPM? Well, TPM is a standard created by the Trusted Computing Group. It's a not-for-profit organization formed to develop and define, promote vendor-neutral global industry specifications and standards based on hardware root of trust for interoperability of all trusted computing platforms. The Trusted Computing Group is involved in a number of things. TPM, another technology they're involved in is TNC, Trusted Network Communications. They're also also working on a project of self-encrypting hard drives, mainly for ATMs. They are presently working on trust in cloud security, trust in virtualization, and trust in IoT. There are five types of TPM. There is discrete, there's integrated, there's firmware, there's software, and there's hypervisor or virtual. We're going to go into all five of these. Keep in mind the purpose of a TPM is to ensure the integrity of a platform, whether it's a motherboard, on a server, or or a laptop or a desktop. Now TPM 2.0 superseded 1.2. The difference is things like it supports more algorithms, it supports more platform configuration registers, it includes three administrative hierarchies, it supports enhanced authorization, supports additional key usages, and supports multiple trusted keys. But by and large TPM 1.2 is very similar to 2.0. In the world of trusted computing there are only two items that are trusted on a mother board. One is what's called CRTM and this is a fixed immutable piece of trusted code and it's in the firmware or in the BIOS and it's loaded at the start of the boot chain. The second component that is trusted is the TPM. Okay Mr. Vanderpool I see a problem right away. We've got this CRTM. It's a fixed immutable piece of trusted code and it's loaded in the BIOS. How do we know that someone doesn't go in and change that trusted code? Well let's talk about that. There's lots of efforts to protect the UEFI code. For example, HP has SureStart. It's an 
it will actually self-check the firmware on the motherboard. If it feels it's been tampered with, it will actually self-heal from a backup copy. It will also do runtime intrusion detections while the operating system is running. Dell has something similar called Safe Bias. If you have servers, you have ILO or iDRAC for Dell servers. Intel uses what's called BootGuard and another technology they call Platform Firmware Resilience. So vendors are very, very aware of not only do they need a TPM, but they've got to protect that firmware code. Dell does an interesting feature where once you boot up on your Dell Enterprise laptop, server, or desktop, it actually goes to the Dell cloud and verifies that the firmware that you have on your platform is Dell's original firmware. Now, this is very similar to what Chromebooks do. Google is already doing this with a Chromebook. So this is not something new, but you can see the importance of layers of security so we're assured that the operating system firmware is what the manufacturer originally intended and we're not dealing with tampered code. So here's a picture of the architecture that Intel uses on its server motherboards. So when you begin to boot, TPMs begin to measure the launching or boot environment. These measurements or hashes are saved in the PCR, the platform configuration registers, in a manner that's infeasible to forge. We have that fixed immutable piece of trusted code in the BIOS that's loaded at the start of the boot chain. Every piece of code in the chain is measured by the predecessor code prior to execution. If anything looks tampered, it stops. So what what do we measure when we're using TPMs and UEFI biases? We measure the bootloader file. We measure the EFI boot services. We measure the EFI runtime services. We measure the UEFI firmware code. We look at the GPT and partition table. We measure the EFI partition. We look at all over in a modern UEFI firmware, we can have up to 200 DXE drivers as part of the firmware initialization. All of those drivers are checked. We also look at ACPI interfaces. This is known as the root of trust for measurement. Let's talk about two important concepts as we're booting a PC, a server, or a laptop. One is called bootstrapping. This is the responsibility of our UEFI firmware. It initializes hardware and the TPM. The TPM establishes a root of trust. It validates the code in the UEFI bootstrap operation and locates the operating system boot loader file. Now Windows, that file is called boot mgrfw.efi. If you're booting Linux, you're going to use the grub file or possibly the Lilo Linux loader. Now boot loader is the very first file in the boot chain to load Windows or in the case of Linux, it would be grub or ILO. We can also enable what's known as secure boot in both of these platforms. Secure boot, if it's enabled in Windows, will launch a file called TCB L-A-U-N-C-H or launch.exe. It kicks in and begins to test each file in the, the Windows boot chain of files. Let's take a look at those five types of TPMs. This is a TPM that can be added to a server. The most secure the most reliable form of TPM is discrete chips, where you can hold that chip in your hand or it's soldered onto a module. This is the best form of all types of TPM available. So discrete TPMs are basically individual chips and they can be soldered onto a board or a module. The Trusted Computing Group has certified the following companies with rights to produce TPM chips. Infineron Technologies, Nuviton, and ST Microelectronics are the three companies that are certified by the trusting computing group to produce TPM discrete chips. Now many companies have been assigned a TPM vendor ID, Intel, Atmel, Broadcom, IBM, Intel, and you can see the list here. Many platforms such as Google's new Wi-Fi routers, Microsoft's tablet, Surface Pro, all take advantage of the Infineron's TPM device. Now this is Google Pixel's TPM chip. You can see an example of that sitting on top of the copper penny. These are very difficult to tamper unless you have a research lab and 20 PhD students that can play and destroy. You're probably not going to be able to tamper physically with this TPM chip. To give you a idea of that, there's an active shield over the entire chip. All memories are internally encrypted. Data independent crypto execution. All math operations 
operations are randomized, internal state consistency checking, voltage tampers and isolated power rails, internal clock generation, they don't rely on the motherboard. They have secure testing methods. There's no debug probe points and no test pads. They're pretty hard to attack physically. Our next video on TPM will be TPM and Windows 10 and Windows 11. And we'll really dive into how to deal with the operating system, how to enable TPM on your motherboard, your servers, how to troubleshoot TPM, and some of the ways that you can check to see if things are functioning correctly. We'll look at integrated TPMs and firmware-based TPMs and hypervisor-based TPMs. And we'll look at IBM's software version. We're going to look at how Windows 11 really leverages its TPM platform. We're going to dive into the components of TPM. We're going to look at Google Pixel's verified boot process. We're going to take a look at Google's Titans, its version of TPM. We're also going to look at why hypervisors with TPMs are so critical in today's operating systems. And we're going to look at the next generation of TPM platforms. Many companies are already moving to field programmable gate arrays for the next generation of hardware root trust. There's going to be a lot of people both in the United States, in Europe, and in other countries that can't afford to just spend money on a new laptop, new motherboard, to get Hyper-V support and TPM support. That's just not going to be possible for many years. I can show you four steps that you can take to take Windows 10 or any operating system that you're using, even Android, iOS, whatever, and harden it so that you can be on the internet as wild as it is today and still be very secure in what you're doing. Start with the Center for Internet Security. Go to the Solutions and go down to CIS Benchmarks. These are free step-by-step -step guides on how to harden your operating system. Let's go up to operating systems. It doesn't matter whether you're using the Mac OS, Linux, you can slide down here till we get to the Microsoft Windows desktop. Download these step-by-step -step guides on how to harden your operating system. It doesn't cost you a dime. Now be, be aware that anytime you harden your operating system, there are going to be certain features that may stop working. That's always a compromise in security. But most of what you need to work in Windows is going to work, even after hardening your operating system. Use these free guidelines, harden your operating system. It doesn't matter, Mr. Vanderpool, what if I have a mobile device? You can do that also. Come up here to mobile devices, and here you can see we've got Google Android and Apple iOS. So whether you have an iPad, an iPhone, or a Google Android, you can harden your operating system while you're on the internet today. They also give you guidelines on how to harden your applications, whether you're using Google Chrome, or Microsoft's web browser, or Firefox, or Zoom, or Safari. There are things that you can do to make it more secure. The second thing I would do is, if you're using Windows, move to the Brave browser. I've been using this browser for a year and a half. It's just the safest, most privacy-focused browser on the planet. It's basically Chrome that has had a lot of thought and effort put into it to make it more privacy focused and more security focused. You still can do everything with Brave that you can do with Chrome, except it's just more secure. So I would definitely encourage you to move to Brave. Now, there are some institutional websites that will not like the high level of security that Brave provides. You can just unremove those security Go to that website, do what you need to do, say a banking website, and you can re-enable the security on Brave. It's simply as turning it on and turning it off. They make it very easy to use. Another thing that I would do is use the Electronic Foundation's Privacy Badger plugin. This is a, an additional feature to either Chrome or Brave or Microsoft's Edge Chromium version. And it adds additional features for preventing trackers and other insecure features on the internet by advertisers. Again, you can turn it on and turn it off if you feel like it's impacting a site that you need to use.
The last thing that you can do, this is step four, that's free, is go to Cloudflare and learn how to set up the public DNS resolver 1.1.1.1. These are simply a layer approach to security and hardening your ability to go on the internet safely and securely. They will, they have a handout that walks you through how to set up the DNS resolver 1.1.1.1. These are four steps cost you nothing but just your time. They will improve your security even on Windows 10 or Android for years to come. Thank mm -hmm. you.